Three's Company was an iconic sitcom in the late 70s and early 80s, starring John Ritter, Joyce DeWitt, Suzanne Somers, and later Priscilla Barnes and Jenny Lee Harrison, as three single roommates who shared a Santa Monica apartment and frequently got into all kinds of hilarious misunderstandings. The sitcom was based on a British sitcom called Man About the House, and it ran for eight seasons on ABC from 1977 through 1984. Behind the scenes, there were many secrets, scandals, mistakes, and bloopers you may not know about. In this video, we'll reveal some of the most surprising facts about the show that'll make you see this beloved sitcom in a whole new light. Facts First presents This Photo Is Not Edited. Look closer at the Three's Company blooper. The Wardrobe Malfunction According to Snopes, actor John Ritter's family jewels were briefly visible in a now notorious episode of Three's Company called The Charming Stranger, which initially aired December 20, 1983. The scene happened when Jack Tripper was dressed in bright blue boxers and flopped down on the bed, exposing some things that probably shouldn't be seen on TV. The blooper went unnoticed for many years until an eagle-eyed viewer alerted Nickelodeon, which was rerunning old episodes, in March of 2001. Nickelodeon confirmed the slip-up and said it would edit it out from future repeats. John Ritter himself laughed off the incident and explained why it was missed for so long during an appearance on Conan O'Brien's Late Night Show. The Not-So-Hidden Crew in Season 8, Episode 2, She Loves Me, She Loves Me Not, shortly after Jack chats with Larry about a magazine quiz, Jack asks Janet if something is troubling her. While Terry is seen leaving the kitchen with two cans in her hand, a crew member's hand can clearly be seen behind Terry, placing a very noticeable bag on the countertop. The Changing Apartment Number in the pilot of the show, Jack moves into an apartment 201 with Janet and Chrissy. However, in later episodes, their apartment number changes to 201A. This is because ABC execs thought viewers would confuse 201 with a room number rather than an apartment number. The Case of the Giggles in Season 5, Episode 17, And Baby Makes Four, when Cindy expresses frustration by saying, Why doesn't anyone give me credit for knowing what I'm doing? Jack snarkily retorts, Well, you keep bumping into things. As soon as John says this, Joyce can't help but break character and laugh. To cover this up, she shields her face with her hands and bends over, while Cindy tries her best to hold back her own laughter and carry on with the scene. The Teleporting Scarf In Season 2, Episode 14, Three's Christmas, right after the trio wraps up opening their presents, Jack makes his way to the kitchen to find Chrissy visibly upset with a scarf over her shoulders. From the other room, Janet asks what's wrong. When the camera cuts back to the kitchen, we're given a close-up of Chrissy with the scarf now sitting on her lap. The Tragic Death John Ritter was not only the star of Three's Company, but also one of its producers and writers. He was beloved by fans and colleagues alike for his comedic talent and warm personality. Sadly, he died unexpectedly September 11, 2003 from an undiagnosed heart condition while filming his new sitcom Eight Simple Rules. He was only 54. The Forgotten Car in the Season 8 episode, Forget Me Not, Janet tells Jack that the car Larry is delivering to her is her very first car. But just five episodes earlier, in Itching for Trouble, Janet is asked by Moose if they had a football that needed any air, to which she replies by saying no, but one of the tires on her car was a bit low. The Questionable Terminology In Season 4, Episode 1, Jack on the Lamb, Jack uses the term AWOL, or absent without leave, but since Jack supposedly served in the Navy, he would have probably used the more commonly used term, UA, instead, which is short for unauthorized absence. The Recycled Set In Season 7, Episode 8, An Affair to Forget, Jack falls for a woman named Randy, who later turns out to be married. When Jack visits Randy's apartment, it looks very familiar. That's because it was the same set used for Janet's flower shop in previous episodes. He's not married. The Flip-Flopping Doorknob 
The doorbell of the three's apartment it was usually shown to be on the left, but sometimes when the plot points called for it, it appeared on the right-hand side of the door. Likewise, the doorbell chime box inside the trio's apartment was initially placed above the kitchen, but in later episodes it can clearly be seen above the front door. The Spin-Off Flops Three's Company had two spin-offs, The Ropers and Three's a Crowd. The Ropers followed the adventures of Mr. and Mr. Roper after they moved to a new condominium complex managed by their snooty neighbor Jeffrey Potts, played by Jeffrey Tambor. Three's a Crowd followed Jack after he moved in with his girlfriend Vicki Bradford, played by Mary Cataret, and had to deal with her meddling father James Bradford, played by Robert Mandon. Both spin-offs were short-lived and failed to match the popularity of Three's Company. The Unauthorized Story In 2003, NBC aired a TV movie called Behind the Camera, The Unauthorized Story of Three's Company. The movie dramatized the behind-the-scenes conflicts and controversies that plagued the show, such as Suzanne Somers' salary dispute, John Ritter's creative differences with the producers, and Joyce DeWitt's feud with Somers. DeWitt served as a co-producer and host of the movie, while Ritter saw the final cut before he died. Summers was also contacted and gave some input. The Wrong Door In Season 4, Episode 18, Handcuffed, Chrissy's cop cousin informs her and the roommates that there was a complaint lodged by one of the neighbors about her husband being on the roof watching the girls dance in the apartment with a pair of binoculars. However, when the girls were actually dancing, the thick drapes were closed and the front door was also closed. So how on earth could such a complaint have even been filed in the first place? The Missing Brother Jack has a brother named Lee in later episodes, but a couple of years before he was introduced, Jack's uncle came to visit and referred to Jack as his favorite nephew. Jack responded to this compliment by saying he was his only nephew. Jack's uncle replied to this factual comment by saying, quote, that never stopped you from being my favorite. The Duplicating Cans In the second season episode, Strange Bedfellows, Mr. Roper attempts to explain to the girls and his nosy wife what he was up to in Jack's bedroom. If you watch the scene closely, paying special attention to what's going on right above Mr. Roper's left shoulder, you'll notice that the number of yellow cans on the shelf keeps switching from one to two cans. Additionally, you can also notice the suitcase on the floor has a square silver bag placed in front of it whenever two yellow cans are present. The Equal Pay Fight Suzanne Somers was one of the most popular stars of the show thanks to her portrayal of ditzy blonde Chrissy Snow. However, she was vastly underpaid compared to her male co-stars. Because of this, she asked for a raise from $30,000 per episode to $150,000 to match what John Ritter was getting. Not only were her demands rejected by ABC and the producers, they immediately fired her. She was still contractually obligated to finish out season 5, but she was then replaced by Jenny Lee Harrison as Cindy Snow. The firing caused a rift between her and her co-stars Joyce DeWitt and John Ritter that lasted for decades. The Early Bird In the episode Not So Great Imposter, which aired in the fifth season, Mr. Angelino enters the kitchen and mentions that steaks are needed for eight guests. If you look behind him at the window in the kitchen door, you can see Janet watching intently as if she were waiting for her cue to enter the scene. Just as soon as you can spot her, however, she ducks out of sight. A moment later, she can be seen once again when Angelino asks Felipe to give him a hand in the freezer. She runs through the door with Furley as if they had just shown up. The Problem with Problem Child Problem Child was released in 1990 and ended up becoming an unexpected hit for Universal Pictures, taking in $72 million at the box office against a budget of just 10. Ritter was the film's most bankable star, but if the studio had been left to their own devices, another actor very easily could have landed the leading role. Problem Child's director, Dennis Dugan, had been friends with John since the days when they were young and up-and-coming players trying to make it in Hollywood. When Dugan was given the chance to direct Problem Child, he knew immediately he wanted John Ritter to take on the role of the adoptive father, Ben Healy. 
There was just one little problem. Universal insisted he find an actor more famous than Ritter. Ignoring their request, Dugan chose Ritter anyway. And after getting the chance to skim over the script, he was on board. Surprisingly, the studio also reverted on their initial reservations and gave Ritter the okay to start working on the project. Hey, if you're enjoying this video so far, make sure you give it a like and subscribe to Facts First if you haven't already. And stay tuned to find out what John Ritter's biggest piece of advice was for his actor son Jason. Life-saving words of wisdom. Between the years of 1972 and 78, Ritter had a recurring role on The Waltons. During those years, the personable actor developed multiple close relationships with his fellow co-stars, including child star Mary Elizabeth McDonough. McDonough once appeared on Oprah's Where Are They Now program, where she revealed Ritter once gave her a piece of advice that ended up saving her life. The young actress had been struggling with her weight and self-image when John told her something that changed her life forever. She was under a lot of pressure to be perfect and to look and act a certain way. But all that started taking a toll on her. When Ritter noticed she was struggling, he pulled her aside to encourage her to start keeping a journal. That's how he was able to come to terms with his own inner struggles, and all he wanted to do was to pass this easy little trick along to her so she could start confronting her own issues. Journaling gave McDonough an outlet to face those body image issues, and today she's a woman's activist and life coach, so clearly she has come far. Kids Break Things in 1984, John Ritter took home the only Emmy Award of his career for Outstanding Lead Actor in a Comedy Series for his role on Three's Company. Not long after taking the trophy home and placing it on his mantle, his four-year-old son accidentally broke it. Jason Ritter recalls seeing the Emmy on the shelf and taking it down to play with it. While he doesn't remember specifically how it broke, he does know for a fact that at a certain point it definitely did. He lived with those feelings of guilt for years. But in reality, all that was broken was a tiny portion of one of the angel's wings. Jason has followed in his father's footsteps by also becoming an actor. He's been nominated for two Emmys, though he's yet to win one. But it's safe to say if he ever does, he'll no doubt be keeping a close eye on his own child. Jason and his fiancée, actress Melanie Linsky, welcomed their first child into the world in December 2018. Stay Grounded when Jason decided he wanted to be like his dad and pursue a career in acting, the former Three's Company actor was more than eager to pass on words of wisdom that he learned during his years of experience in the industry. His biggest piece of advice for his son was stressing the importance of staying grounded, no matter how well or otherwise your career is going. Reflecting on his father's insights, Jason noted that John always stressed that the idea of celebrity, as nice as it can feel at times, can't ever take precedent over what's truly important in life, like having solid friends and maintaining a healthy family life. Jason explained that his dad, even though he was a huge celebrity, always maintained a level head and did his best to tune out most of the noise. Jason offered his own advice as well by reminding aspiring stars that whether people say bad stuff or good stuff about you, you'd be wise not to believe either. He was funny that way. She's Funny That Way, a romantic comedy starring Owen Wilson, Will Forte, and Jennifer Aniston, hit theaters in 2015. But if history had played out differently, the ensemble would have included John Ritter. The film's writer and director, Peter Bogdanovich, started working on the film in the late 90s. He had previously gotten the opportunity to work with Ritter on his 1981 film, They All Laughed, and wanted to reunite the former star by pitting him in the lead role. The film ended up in development hell, as many rewrites and conflicting commitments made it very difficult to move forward. Even so, the two remained close. In 2003, Bogdanovich was getting ready to do a guest spot on John's Eight Simple Rules sitcom when Ritter started having chest pains. He was rushed to surgery as his doctors desperately tried their best to save him. Unfortunately, they exhausted all of their options, and Ritter died just hours later on the operating table. Grief-stricken over the loss of his close friend, Bogdanovich decided it's best to shelve his She's Funny That Way script, uncertain whether his film would see the light of day. Ten years later, after a chance run-in with Owen Wilson, the filmmaker rewrote the script and moved forward with its production. One Creepy Doll even though the bulk of his credits were in comedies, Ritter occasionally branched out into other genres. Such was the case in 1998 when he signed on 
to star in the campy slasher flick Bride of Chucky, the fourth installment in the Child's Play series of horror films. In the film, John played a prideful and manipulative police chief who died at the hands of the devilish duo of dolls Chucky and Tiffany. He met his demise when they shoot nails into his face before stabbing him. If you think that's gritty, keep in mind it could have been a lot worse. Screenwriter Don Mancini once revealed that Ritter's on-screen death was originally going to be a lot more gruesome. There was supposed to be a scene where Chucky and Ritter had one last face-off. The idea was for the nails embedded in Ritter's face to be used one last time. He was supposed to be tossed out of the vehicle onto the highway where a cop car would roll over the nails, have a blowout, and explode in a ball of flames. But Mancini's team wasn't able to pull that one off. Ritter will always be remembered. Even though he's been dead for 18 or so years, it hasn't stopped Ritter's former co-stars from singing praises about their fallen friend. In 2015, former Three's Company castmate Suzanne Summers dedicated her performance on the competition reality show Dancing with the Stars to the late actor. Then there's Kaylee Cuoco who played Ritter's daughter on Eight Simple Rules before starring in The Big Bang Theory. She says there's not a day that goes by that John Ritter doesn't bring a smile to her face. Its premise is wildly outdated. Three's Company was all about three friends who wanted to save money by living together in a pricey Santa Monica apartment complex. You had the two ladies, Janet and Chrissy, and then you had Jack. Apparently the idea of two women living together with a man was super scandalous to their landlords, the Ropers. So they resorted to pretending Jack was gay to pull a fast one. On the one hand, the series' plot could be seen as pretty progressive. After all, being an openly gay man in 1976 wasn't very common, but the notion that the Ropers wouldn't allow roommates of the opposite sex to cohabitate was pretty backwards. Beyond that, the majority of the show's running gags and sexual innuendos probably wouldn't sit well with contemporary viewers. John Ritter Stole the Show it wasn't long into the show's run before it became a massive hit with audiences and a pop culture sensation. In the blink of an eye, the sitcom's trio of stars, who were all still pretty early in their careers, were transformed into superstars. John had previously been on The Waltons for a few years and had guest starred on pretty much all the Mary Tyler Moore shows. He also starred in 1971's The Barefoot Executive. So even if he wasn't well known by name, he was a face people were familiar with. While the three roommates were without a doubt the focus of the series, it was Ritter's performance that really stole the show. He had a gift for physical comedy and quickly became a huge draw. On top of that, the show didn't mind pushing the envelope a bit with its witty sexual innuendo and Jack was normally at the center of these jokes. Unfortunately, Ritter's popularity ended up becoming a source of tension on set. Suzanne Somers wanted to be the star Prior to appearing on Three's Company, Suzanne Somers enjoyed minor roles in several films. Probably the biggest role she'd previously played was a mysterious blonde who enchants Richard Dreyfuss in the George Lucas film American Graffiti. On TV, she'd made appearances in shows like Starsky and Hutch and The Rockford Files. Despite the success she had already achieved, Summers was someone who desperately wanted to be a bigger star. She had started out life quite poor and later on became a single mother. So once she started pursuing her acting career, she threw every last bit of herself into it. She didn't just want to pop up on the radar for a few years, making the rounds on the television guest star circuit. She wanted to be a full-fledged celebrity. When Summers found out there was a substantial pay gap between her and her male co-star Ritter, she was livid. She'd been under the impression she would be the standout star, but Ritter's charisma and magnetism proved to draw in more viewers than the sitcom's producers had anticipated. Summers was being paid $30,000 an episode, while Ritter was getting $150,000. grand. When her contract ran out at the end of the sixth season, she demanded a raise. When the network brass refused, they also fired her. What killed Three's company? While you might assume that losing one-third of a trio of main cast members on a show that's literally called Three's Company would bring the series to a crashing halt, it actually fared quite well without Summers. Actress Jenny Lee Harrison was called in to serve as a semi-replacement, playing Cindy, Chrissy's cousin. There's no single reason why Three's Company's cord was ultimately pulled. Its end was brought out by a multitude of factors. During its final season, Ritter won a Golden Globe and an Emmy, while the show as a whole was awarded with a People's Choice Award. Fans even point to several episodes from the eighth season they consider to be among the show's best. One major issue, though, that became increasingly evident was it began to feel like the writers had started to run out of material. 
Beyond that, other television trends were beginning to impact Three's company's viewership. In 1983, The A-Team premiered on NBC and started dominating its time slot. That show's often credited with knocking off popular shows like The Jeffersons and Happy Days. And then you had Laverne and Shirley, which beat out Three's company that year as well. The writing seemed to be on the wall, the sitcom itself was dying. The scene that took Three's company off the air. ABC decided to axe Three's company at the end of its eighth season, but they weren't quite ready to move on completely. Seeing a lot of potential in John Ritter's vibrant energy and physical comedy, they gave him his own spin-off show, Three's a Crowd. The final episode of Three's Company, Friends and Lovers Part 2, was essentially a bridge that would lead into this new series. Three's a Crowd was about Jack Tripper, his girlfriend Vicki Bradford, and her meddling father James forced to live with each other. In Friends and Lovers Part 2, Vicki suggests that she and Jack should live together. While he was at first a bit reluctant, being the old school kind of guy he was, he eventually agrees to it so he wouldn't risk losing her. The following week, Larry and Furley help the trio move out of the apartment. Terry goes off to catch a flight to Hawaii, where she plans to continue her career as a nurse, while Janet sits out to live with her new husband. Once Jack and Vicky are settled into their new apartment, they propose a toast to celebrate things before heading off to the bedroom. As they begin kissing, James enters into their bedroom and proceeds to announce he just purchased the entire building, including Jack's bistro, and most importantly, their apartment, making him their new landlord. Three's a crowd fell flat. While some spin-off sitcoms like Frasier, The Jeffersons, and Archie Bunker's Place end up being successful, Three's a Crowd was not. While Ritter continued to be the center of the show, he wasn't backed up by the right ensemble. The cast of Three's Company had tremendous chemistry, even after a few change-ups to its lineup. Three's a Crowd should have attempted to bring in a few of the characters from Three's Company, but instead it felt like all those characters were killed off. Fans of Three's Company rejected Vicky from the start. It wasn't that Mary Cataret wasn't a decent actress, but audiences never warmed up to her character. And then there was Vicky's dad, James Bradford. No one wanted to see him all the time. At least on Three's Company, Mr. Roper and Mr. Furley only showed up on occasion. James, however, was always there lurking and being an all-around buzzkill. After one season of 22 episodes, ABC decided enough was enough and canceled Three's a Crowd. Joyce and Suzanne's Relationship Joyce DeWitt and Suzanne Summers are best known for Janet and Chrissy on Three's Company. Their on-screen chemistry, along with John Ritter's, was a significant factor in the success of the show. But their off-screen relationship experienced both camaraderie and tension. In the early years of the show, DeWitt and Summers enjoyed a positive working relationship. Their characters, along with Ritter's, formed a comedic trio that resonated with audiences. The actress's rapport on set contributed to the believable friendship portrayed on screen. But as the show progressed, tensions emerged. The primary source of contention was Summers' contract renegotiation in 1980. She wanted a significant salary increase and a percentage of the show's profits, as she was being paid significantly less than her co-star, John Ritter. This led to a standoff with the producers. During this period, Summers was often absent from tapings, leading to her scenes being taped separately and reducing her role in the series. This situation strained her relationship with the cast, especially DeWitt and Ritter. Though it was said by Summers that this was not her choice, and the producers did it as a punishment for her contract negotiations, as they fired her. After she was fired, she left the show in 1981. After Summers' departure from Three's Company, she and DeWitt had limited contact for several years. Both actresses pursued their respective careers, with Summers branching out into various ventures, including a successful stint in Las Vegas, and DeWitt continuing her acting career in both television and theater. Decades after the end of Three's Company, the two publicly reconciled. In 2012, they appeared together on Summers' web series, Breaking Through, where they discussed their past differences and celebrated their time on the show. The reunion was emotional, with both actresses expressing regret over the years of estrangement. Bare Legs Joyce had a distinct personal role during her time on Three's Company. She chose not to show her bare legs. The decision was quite noticeable, especially when contrasted with her co-star, Suzanne Summers, whose character, Chrissy Snow, often wore outfits that showcased her legs. DeWitt's decision was rooted in a desire to differentiate her character from Summers' character. While Chrissy was portrayed as the bubbly, somewhat ditzy blonde, Janet was the more grounded and sensible roommate. DeWitt felt that by keeping her legs covered, it would help emphasize these character differences and reduce the potential for the two female leads to be seen as too similar 
or interchangeable in terms of their on-screen personas. And DeWitt wanted her character to be recognized for her personality and comedic skills rather than physical appearance. Throughout the show, DeWitt remained consistent with this choice. Janet was often seen wearing long skirts, pants, or tights, even in situations where other characters might be in swimwear or shorter outfits. Joyce refused to say one specific line. During the season when Suzanne Somers' contract dispute was happening and she was essentially banished to filming separately from the rest of the cast, tensions were particularly high on set. And perhaps this led to more bold and assertive behavior all around. One such moment was during the filming of Episode 3. In it, Chrissy is mistakenly identified as a prostitute. This is partly because she has a friend who actually is a prostitute, and so, in classic sitcom fashion, it's accidentally understood Chrissy is as well. At the end of the episode, the friend says of Chrissy that she's priceless, aka she could never be purchased for a role in the hay. And Janet was supposed to say, quote, and she's going to stay that way. The insinuation was that Janet was asserting Chrissy would never sell her body. But Joyce had major issues with the line. She felt it would be hypocritical for her to say something disparaging about sex work, since she seemed to be totally fine with the fact that Chrissy's friend was a prostitute. So she spent all week in rehearsals saying that she would refuse to say it. John Ritter agreed and even told the producers he'd say the line. But when it came to the shoot day, it was still written in the script as a line for Janet. Joyce was furious. She'd been complaining about it for days and had been more than clear that she wouldn't say the line. A producer asked her to do it once more. Joyce's response, quote, I leaned back in my chair and took the deepest breath. And instead of answering this idiotic question, I said, Mickey, I'll tell you what the deal is with the line. You can come out with a gun during the 5.30 show and hold it to my head, and I still won't say that line for you. Is that clear enough? That's why it took. So clearly Joyce is a woman not afraid to speak her mind. Audition Process Joyce's audition for Three's Company was a standout moment for the show's creators. While many actresses were vying for the role of Janet Wood, DeWitt's portrayal struck the right balance of warmth, humor, and relatability. Her natural chemistry with John Ritter, who had already been cast as Jack Tripper, was evident from her initial screen test with him. This immediate connection and her understanding of the character made her the producer's top choice, and she was one of the first of the main actors to secure her spot on the show. Dance Background Before her foray into television, DeWitt had an extensive background in theater and dance. She trained as a dancer from a young age and even considered pursuing it professionally. This background was subtly incorporated into Three's company. In several episodes, her dance skills were highlighted, such as when she took ballet lessons or participated in dance-themed events. These moments allowed DeWitt to merge her real-life passion with her on-screen character. Close with Ritter Off the set, Joyce and John shared a bond that was as strong as their on-screen camaraderie. They often spent time together outside of filming, attending events, and supporting each other's endeavors. Their genuine friendship was a cornerstone of the show's success, as their natural rapport and mutual respect translated into a believable and endearing on-screen relationship. Even after the show ended, DeWitt often spoke fondly of Ritter and their time together. Live Audience Unlike many sitcoms that use a pre-recorded laugh track, Three's Company was filmed in front of a live studio audience and Joyce DeWitt was particularly fond of this format. She believed that real-time reactions from an audience added a unique energy to the performances. The immediate feedback, the laughter, and even the occasional unexpected responses from the audience kept the actors on their toes, and often infused the scenes with a spontaneous and genuine feel. DeWitt has mentioned in interviews how the live audience's energy was palpable and how it often influenced the cast's performances making them more dynamic and responses. Hair Changes Fans of Three's Company will have noticed that throughout the show's run, Joyce DeWitt's hairstyles underwent several transformations. From curly to straight, from long to short, her changing hairstyles became a subtle subplot of its own. These changes were not just fashion statements, they were reflective of DeWitt's desire to keep her character fresh and evolving. Each new hairstyle marked a new phase or development in Janet's life. 
Who is Joyce DeWitt? Joyce was born April 23, 1949, in Wheeling, West Virginia. She's the daughter of Paul and Norma DeWitt and has three older siblings, two brothers named Douglas and David, and one sister, Ruth. Joyce's family moved when she was five years old to the town of Speedway, Indiana, a northern suburb of Indianapolis. She began her acting career at 13, taking part in various ads for food, clothing, and shoes. In the 60s, Joyce ventured into theater plays and productions. Despite the many rumors on the internet, she was never mentored by actor Abe Vigoda, and the two never even met. In 1975, the young actress landed her first role on TV in Beretta. That same year, she also starred in Most Wanted. Even though these were small, supporting roles, they helped her launch her career becoming a main cast member of Three's Company. Joyce DeWitt gained international popularity in 1977 after joining the show Three's Company. The sitcom aired on ABC from March of 1977 to September of 1984. In the series, Joyce began rooming with other rising stars in the film industry, Suzanne Somers and John Ritter. The show focused on the three main cast members who were residents of the fictional Apartment 201 in Santa Monica, California. Everything was going well until the cast experienced a falling out and Joyce felt betrayed and left out by her colleagues. Janet Wood instantly became a fan favorite thanks to her spunky personality, funky style, and especially because of her eye for pretty things. During her tenure on the show, she worked and managed the arcade flower shop. Janet was portrayed as the intelligent, reliable, and responsible roommate, as opposed to her ditzy blonde counterpart, Chrissy. The florist brought a calmness to the always buzzing and chaotic apartment that she shared with Jack and Chrissy. But just like many successful projects, this one included a lot of controversies. The main controversy surrounding the show was Suzanne Summers, because of whom the cast experienced a huge falling out. Summers disputed her pay in the early 1980s, especially after her character became a media icon and elevated her to a rich television superstar. She questioned her salary, expecting to receive equal or greater earnings than that of John Ritter, the main male star of the show. To prove the difference in question, by the fifth season of Three's Company, Summers was receiving $30,000 an episode, while Ritter was earning $150,000 an episode. Eventually, after multiple protests and fights, she and the show parted ways. After she left the show, Summers' character was replaced by her fictional cousin, Cindy Snow. The departure caused a rift between all three castmates, and despite being media sensations, they didn't communicate with each other. Luckily, Suzanne was able to reconnect with John Ritter before he sadly passed away. A few years later, she rebuilt the connection between herself and Joyce DeWitt through her online show, Breaking Through. In addition to these differences, there was also another thing that caused caused deception between Joyce and John Ritter, the creation of the spin-off titled Three's a Crowd. When Three's company was coming to an end, it was revealed the directors and producers were working on a spin-off. To the surprise of its fans, the spin-off included only Jack Ritter's character and said nothing about his former roommates, Chrissy or Janet. It was reported via numerous sources that DeWitt felt betrayed and left out for not being given a role. It was also heartbreaking for her to find out about this from Vicki Crawford, who played the role of Mary Cataret and whose character was introduced at the end of Three's Company. The spin-off continuation aired on ABC immediately after the finale of Three's Company, and, as expected, it didn't do well in the ratings. It was canceled after a season. If you're enjoying this video so far, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Click the bell icon to stay updated on our latest content. After Three's Company In the early 80s, after the show's conclusion, Joyce had a brief role in an episode of Finder of Lost Dove. She was later given an opportunity to star in this and other shows such as The Rappers, All in the Family, Maud, and She's the Sheriff. Ultimately, due to a lot of issues in her personal life, the TV star decided to quit acting for several years. She resumed acting in June of 1991, taking part in the production of Noises Off at the Cherry County Playhouse in Michigan. A few years later, she returned to TV and appeared in the comedy film Spring Fling. In the late years of the century, the actress had a small role in the CBS sitcom Sybil, followed by two appearances on Living Single and Twitch City as herself. DeWitt started the new millennium with several guest appearances on The First 50 Years and The Truth Behind the Sitcom Scandals, where she was asked about working with Suzanne Somers and John Ritter. She was interviewed about her experience on the classic sitcom, the drama between her and her castmates, and what it felt like to finally rise to popularity. Around the same time, she performed in Hope Island and the Nick at Night Holiday Special. Starting in the 2000s, she's mostly been appearing on reality shows, television specials, and documentaries rather than films or TV series. 
series. In 2003, she made her debut as a producer in the film Behind the Camera, the unauthorized and untold story of Three's Company. She also hosted it. The NBC documentary followed the success of the sitcom and the interpersonal conflicts that occurred among the cast and staff. Melanie Paxson was chosen to portray Joyce DeWitt. Through the past two decades, Joyce occasionally starred in films and TV series. Her most notable appearances were in the feature films Call of the Wild, Falling Better Now, Snapshot, and My Boyfriend's Dog. She also returned to the theater, performing in several plays such as Miss Abigail's Guide to Dating, Dinner with Friends, and Love Letters. DeWitt has also been consistently doing charity work. Her charity work includes hosting presentations for the Hollywood Family Assistance Program, the International Awards Ceremony at the White House, and the World Food Day Gala alongside Jeff Bridges. In many people's eyes, Joyce was considered a star, especially after her highly praised work on Three's Company. However, quitting acting played an important role in her downfall. Number 10. First Day Friendships The three main characters on the show met at their first film day. The natural chemistry between on-screen roommates Suzanne Somers, Joyce DeWitt, and John Ritter played a large role in the success of the series. Fans would never have guessed the trio met on the first episode of season one. All three cast members, Suzanne, Joyce, and John, were put together on the first day of filming, expected to read their lines and act with one another. The producers' assumptions were validated after witnessing how well the actors got along. Strong on-screen chemistry between actors and actresses is the foundation of any successful TV series. Number 9. Blonde Locks Suzanne Somers is known for her platinum blonde hair. Her trademark feature is recognizable, as Chrissy Snow was the only blonde roommate. However, during the well-known opening scene and theme song, Jack rides his bike alongside the beach. A beautiful brunette woman walks past him, and he falls off his bike. Little did fans know, the woman was actually Suzanne Summers with brunette hair. Summers wore a wig for the clip and disguised her blonde locks. Fans would be shocked to know the woman who caught Jack's eye was actually fellow roommate Chrissy, in a wig. Number 8. Almost, but not quite. John Ritter was the perfect selection for the character of Jack Tripper. After eight seasons, fans loved and adored Jack for his goofy personality. However, Ritter almost didn't get the part. Actor Billy Crystal was also up for the male roommate role. Had Billy been cast as Jack, Three's Company wouldn't be what it is today. In fact, the show may not have run for eight seasons with Billy as Jack. The chemistry of the actors and actresses was a major component to its long-standing success. Ritter eventually got the part, and Crystal became successful in his own right. He portrayed Harry Burns in the iconic movie When Harry Met Sally, as well as Miracle Max in the classic film The Princess Bride. Number 7. All Are Created Equal Suzanne Somers was popular in her role as Chrissy. However, after her exit from the show in 1981, fans were curious and heartbroken over her departure. This may come as a surprise, but Suzanne actually left over unequal pay. During the 70s and 80s, male actors earning triple what their female co-stars were making was all too common. Somers earned $30,000 an episode, while male co-star Ritter earned $150,000 per episode. That's five times more. As a result, Summers demanded the same compensation as her male co-stars. After production denied her request, they found a way to quietly write her off the iconic series. Even after this incident, Summers continued to gain roles and success in Hollywood. She starred in another popular sitcom called Step by Step. While rumors speculate there may have been another reason for her exit, Summers confirmed unequal pay was the sole reason for her departure. In fact, when she met with executives of the show, she was removed just for requesting equal pay. Even ranking as a top actress at the time, Summers was not able to keep her role as Chrissy and receive the same compensation as John Ritter. After six seasons, Suzanne believed she should earn the same amount as her male co-stars. During an interview, she stated finishing the show was painful and difficult. Her role was reduced to a few minutes at the end of each episode, where she was forced to finish out her character Chrissy. Suzanne said it was a difficult time, as she was not allowed to see any other cast members. The only people she interacted with during those final scenes was wardrobe personnel. Even being the highest-rated actress for her desired demographic, Suzanne was not able to retain her role in Three's Company, something fans have been largely unaware of. Many have called her ahead of her time for taking a strong stance on gender equality in the early 80s. Number 6. Stay a little longer, Larry Jack Tripper's best friend, Larry, was well known for being a funny Casanova. He always had a humorous line that made the cast and audience crack up. The show would not have the same sparkle without Larry. However, his character was originally written as a one-time appearance. After the reaction from fans, production decided to make him a regular in the cast. Not only did the audience enjoy his character, but Larry and Jack had a great on-screen chemistry. Richard Klein and John Ritter got along well in real life, adding to their authentic friendship in the sitcom. Number 5. Stanley Roper is Real Stanley Roper was played by Norman Fell. Fans instantly loved his stubborn personality and comical relationship with wife Helen Roper. The character of Stanley Roper is a real person, someone Norman knew personally. 
That's right, the fictional landlord of Chrissy, Janet, and Jack was real. Norman Fell knew someone who was obsessed with money and materialistic. The character of Mr. Roper was important for the storyline of the series. Due to his personal experience, Norman created an authentic and genuine version of Mr. Roper. His character also blended well with his wife, Helen, played by Audra Lindley. While Norman may not have been the biggest fan of Mr. Roper in real life, the inspiration served him well as fans loved the character. Number 4. Last Minute Suzanne Suzanne Summers got the part of Chrissy Snow at the last minute. Production was scheduled to begin soon, while the role of Chrissy was still pending. The deadline was drawing nearer, yet executives couldn't seem to fill the role. Luckily, after scrolling through hours of audition tapes, Suzanne's tape was discovered. Executive Fred Silverman instantly knew she was the woman for the role. Suzanne was hired the next day. This was essential, as production was scheduled to begin the next morning. This was why the trio never met prior to their first day. Number 3. Knotts Gets Nervous Don Knotts, known by fans as Mr. Furley, was nervous and intimidated by Three's company. This comes as a shock to many as Knotts was already a successful actor and comedian in Hollywood prior to the series. In fact, Knotts starred in The Andy Griffith Show, playing the role of Barney Fife during the 60s. The reason Knotts was intimidated was due to cameras. During the 60s, only one camera was used to film shows. By the time production began for Three's Company, teams were using three cameras to shoot. This upgrade initially overwhelmed Knotts. However, his jitters were calmed after his first on-screen appearance. After receiving a standing ovation, he quickly adjusted to the new setup and continued to play his character as Mr. Furley. Number 2. Priscilla Barnes was unhappy After Suzanne Somers' exit from the show in 1981, the role was filled by Priscilla Barnes. Priscilla played Terry Alden. She was a nurse who became the third roommate. Barnes was featured on the show for the final three seasons. While many would assume this show was the opportunity of a lifetime for Priscilla, she was unhappy with her job. Barnes said producers were demanding and controlling. She was even called out for her hair being too blonde. She noted she got in trouble for small things. Number 1. Third Time's a Charm Three's company gained instant success after airing. However, hard work and dedication played a large role. After a total of eight seasons, the series is still celebrated for its funny and entertaining storylines. Even after 43 years since the first episode aired, Three's company remains quintessential. The cast worked hard during production. In fact, two other pilots were made for the show. The cast was rewarded for their time, effort, and hard work during the Emmys and Golden Globes, where the show won for their category, along with other prestigious awards. Receiving a primetime Emmy or Golden Globe is a big deal in the entertainment industry, and Three's Company was able to pull through even with numerous changes. The male actors were making five times that of the female actresses. When Suzanne Somers first agreed to be on the show, she accepted a $3,500 weekly salary to play the lively Chrissy Snow. And as the show gained viewers and soared in the ratings, her salary ballooned to $30,000 a week. Very quickly, however, she started to pick up on some of the undercurrents of the industry that she didn't initially grasp when she first came on the scene. She knew her worth as an actress. She had the highest demographic of women in television from 18 to 49. It made no sense to her that all the men were making up to 10 times what she was. Ritter and DeWitt already had their contracts worked out, so before she went to the negotiating table, she informed them she was planning on going into the talks strong. She was going to ask for the big bucks, and if she was to be successful in her endeavor, then John and Joyce were likely to benefit from it as well. She knew there was some risk of backlash for her request, but she never would have guessed they would straight up fire her just for asking for equal pay. That thought never crossed her mind. Alan Hamill, Summer's husband and former TV producer, went in to negotiate for her. He asked for a $150,000 weekly salary, which was pretty average for male actors in TV at the time. In fact, that's what John Ritter was being paid. Although Summers had no idea he was being paid so high, because all three leads had most favored nations clauses in their contracts, which essentially means that the network agreed to pay and treat them each equitably. By the way, if you're enjoying this video so far, make sure you give it a like and subscribe to our channel. Tap the bell icon to turn on notifications so you can keep up with all our latest videos. And keep watching to see how Suzanne Summers' request for equal pay panned out and how that outcome wound up being her career turning point. Another program's negotiations impacted the outcome. Before Hamill went into the meeting, he checked back in with Summers and even warned her things could hypothetically go very poorly. 
Summers was unswayed by concerns, and reasoned they would never get rid of Chrissy. Hamill and Summers were oblivious to one contributing factor that would make negotiating a higher salary quite difficult. ABC had just finalized a massive deal with the co-stars of Laverne and Shirley, Penny Marshall and Cindy Williams, and they were already a bit peeved they had to pay the two women what they did. So Hamill and Summers' attempt at negotiating higher pay was about to be shot down with quickness. They were simply not willing to dig any deeper into their pocketbooks than they were already doing. Doing. They didn't want the Laverne and Shirley negotiations to signal to other women that they could all ask for more money, so they set out to make an example of any other female actress forthcoming that was going to ask for more cash. Seeing as there were no cell phones back then, Summer sat at home, anxiously waiting for her husband to come home from the contract talks. When he finally came home, she could tell by the way he opened and shut the door, and from the cadence of his footsteps, that something didn't go as planned. Then he broke the news to her she had been fired. One thing Summers learned from how things played out that day is that in Hollywood, you should never think you aren't replaceable, because you always are. It just comes with the territory. After she was given the boot, Summers was escorted by police on set. If that news wasn't already bad enough, Summers was still locked in to finish up filming the fifth season, but when she arrived back on set, the vibe had noticeably changed. It definitely was no longer business as usual. A certain heavy uneasiness hung in the air. It must have been awkward to be obligated to finish out the year knowing you had already been fired, but to make matters worse, they downgraded Summers' role in the series dramatically. They even built a special side set where only she was allowed to go. She would be met by a police guard at the back door who would let her in, but she wasn't allowed to interact with any of the other cast and crew members of the show. She was only permitted to deal with the wardrobe staffer who would bring her the occasional clothing item. On the minimal set, there was just a chair, phone, and lamp. One camera facing her would film her saying her lines into the phone. That's all the producers of the show felt like she deserved. While she was once a prominent and essential member of the team, she was now being treated as an outcast, and it was beginning to take its toll on Summers. She felt like she was being punished just for asking to be treated equally. Suddenly, a flood of old emotions came in. Feelings of doubt and crippling low self-worth began to plague her. What they did to her was demeaning and shameful. Hollywood shunned her, so she proved them wrong by reinventing herself. Off the Three's company set, life wasn't much better for Summers. One moment, she was one of the most celebrated young actresses in her demographic, and the next, she couldn't even secure an interview with the press. Summers began to slip into self-doubt. She wondered why she dared to ever ask for equal pay when she had such a good thing going already. She had the world in her hands, but she lost it in the blink of an eye. After a couple weeks of wallowing, Summers suddenly had an epiphany. Her inner voice could no longer be ignored. It finally clicked with her that she should focus on what she had, not on what she might have lost. Being a cast member of Three's Company had given her something that nobody, no network board or executive, could take away from her. She had something invaluable. Visibility. Summer set out on a mission to use her name and image to stage a comeback. But in order to do so, she would have to totally reinvent herself. She set her sights on Vegas, and soon enough she was up on stage with 13 dancers and a 27-piece orchestra performing a lively nightly variety show. In 1987, she was awarded the title of Las Vegas Entertainer of the Year, alongside the great Frank Sinatra. To put her on the same tier as Old Blue Eyes himself is quite an honor. She was really doing it. She had rebranded herself in a way that gave her career a whole new wind. These days, she's known as a very successful entrepreneur, fitness guru, author, and talk show host. She's a woman of many hats, and never again will she let a board of misogynists tell her she's not entitled to the compensation she deserves. Being fired was indeed a low blow at the time it happened. But once she heard that empowered voice of wisdom within herself, she was able to transmute those hurt feelings and frustration into fuel to advance her career and pursue her passions. Getting denied equal pay just encouraged her to prove her worth to the world and show her haters and critics she was fully capable of succeeding on her own. She never would have become the person she is today if she hadn't fought for what she thought was right. And even though the Three's Company execs didn't believe in her, she continued to believe in herself. Suzanne Summer's story is certainly inspiring. It goes to show you you should never give up, even when standing in front of those who don't believe in you. Life is what you make of it, and Summer's certainly made a life for herself. Suzanne Summers was born in 1946. Although she would end up becoming popular by her husband's last name, she was born Suzanne Marie Mahoney. Unlike many other Hollywood stars, Summers was not born into a family with a background in the entertainment industry. Her mother worked in the medical field as a secretary, and her father was a laborer with an affinity for gardening. Her father may have been a hard worker, but he wasn't the most affable man to be around. 
According to Summers, he was a heavy drinker and would often tease her relentlessly and call her names as she was growing up. However, this teasing only made the young woman that much more adamant that she would eventually take the world by storm. She graduated high school and then attended college. She would go on to marry her first husband, Bruce Summers, in 1965. Although the marriage only lasted three years, she would keep his last name. After the marriage dissolved, she decided to take her career in entertainment a little more seriously. She would end up becoming a prize model on the game show Anniversary Game. Over time, she would develop a fairly close relationship with the host of that show, Alan Hamill. The two would eventually marry in 1977, the same year Three's Company premiered. He played an incredibly large role in her life and career. He's often blamed for catalyzing the events that made Suzanne leave the show after its fifth season. Summers used her success as a prize model to get increasingly better roles in film and TV. She wasn't afraid to use her good looks and charisma to get both the attention of producers and the audience. She was often seen as a femme fatale, appearing in many TV shows and films that capitalized on this image. Around the same time, she also slowly began pursuing a career as an author, having written a book of poetry that achieved minor success. Some of her notable early roles in film include parts in American Graffiti and Magnum Force. On TV, she could be seen doing bit parts on shows such as One Day at a Time, The Six Million Dollar Man, and The Rockford Files. Although her parts were often fairly small, they made a big impression on the audience. She received steady work throughout the early 70s. But her breakthrough role wouldn't come until the premiere of Three's Company in 1977. On that show, Summers portrayed Chrissy Snow. The producers had already gone through two separate candidates that they didn't feel were quite right, but their luck changed when they caught Summers promoting her book of poetry on The Tonight Show. Immediately, they had a feeling this was the woman who was meant to play Chrissy. And they were right on the money. Three's Company was the story of three single co-ed roommates. These roommates were Jack Tripper, Janet Wood, and Chrissy Snow. Jack was played by John Ritter, and Janet Wood was played by Joyce DeWitt. Their landlords were initially played by Norman Fell and Helen Roper, but the two would end up leaving the show in 1979. After they left, famous comedian and character actor Don Knotts was brought on to take their place. This lineup went on to be the most iconic lineup of the show's long and successful run. The show was a success almost immediately, and Chrissy Snow was arguably the biggest reason. Audiences cheered every time Summers came onto the screen. Her role became so popular that Summers eventually began to question if she was being paid as much as she was worth. John Ritter was making more than Summers per episode, and the actress began to understandably have some issues with this. Many assume that Summers' husband, Alan Hamill, convinced her to take some course of action to remedy this discrepancy in pay. After the show's fourth season, Summers made some demands regarding her earnings that the producers weren't exactly comfortable with. Hey, if you're enjoying this video so far, hit the like button to show your support. And be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification button to stay updated on our latest content. Suzanne Summers had a reason to be upset about making less money per episode than John Ritter. She was arguably the main drawing point of the show and not being properly compensated for it. It's not surprising then the actors ended up asking the show's producer for an increase in pay. While many would assume this wouldn't be too big of a deal given how Summers was contributing to the show, the amount of pay increase she asked for was arguably a little excessive. At the time, she was only making $30,000 per episode. However, her demand to the producers was to be paid $150,000. She also asked to be given 10% ownership of the show's rights. The producers balked at her request. Instead, they reduced her role down to only 60 seconds per episode throughout the show's fifth season, before eventually firing her and writing her character out. The void she left would end up being filled by a few different characters, but none of them could capture the magic Summers brought to the table. Once Summers was gone, it was only a matter of time before the show fell apart. However, Summers had a bright future ahead of her. The episode caused a rift between Summers and her co-stars, including John Ritter. She didn't end up talking to the actor again for two decades, making up with him shortly before his untimely death in 2003. However, Summers' burning of these bridges would not go on to have many detrimental effects on her promising career. The actress's status as a sex symbol was solidified when she took the opportunity to pose nude in Playboy. She appeared once in 1980 and once again in 1984. To the world over, Suzanne Summers was a star, with or without Three's Company. 
Her biggest post threes company career revelation came during her tenure as a spokeswoman for the popular piece of exercise equipment known as the Thighmaster. Not only did the campaign further her appeal as a sex symbol, it also proved influential on her overall career moving forward. With this campaign, Summers began to see the potential of being a health and fitness advocate. Her good looks weren't just something to be admired, and she could put them to use by showing others how to live healthy and active lifestyles. This played a huge part in Summers' career moving forward into the next century. Before becoming better known as an advocate for fitness and healthy living than as an entertainer, Summers did continue her acting career in TV and film throughout the late 80s and 90s. In 1987, she appeared in the show She's the Sheriff. In that show, she was the titular star. After that, she was featured in a recurring role on the series Step by Step in the 90s. She also co-hosted the show Candid Camera in the late 90s. Any way you look at it, Suzanne was never hurting for success or commercial appeal. In the 2000s, her star remained fairly consistent. In 2005, she performed in a one-woman show on Broadway. It was titled The Blonde in the Thunderbird, named after her iconic role in the film American Graffiti. This show allowed Summers to renew her personal relationship with her fan base, and she capitalized on that success soon after with the publication of her book, Ageless. In her written works, Summers began making a new name for herself as an advocate for exercise and healthy living. She shared her lifestyle and diet with other people, and soon Summers was known more for her lifestyle advocacy than her acting. She followed up Ageless with numerous other works, most of which would be centered around her lifestyle and diet. Summers didn't end her career as an entertainer just because she had become a famous author. She continued to take a prominent role in entertainment. She hosted her own online talk show titled Breaking Through. This experience led her to take the lead in a televised talk show on the Lifetime Network titled The Suzanne Show. More recently, she put her good looks and fitness to the test on the reality competition show Dancing with the Stars. Although she only finished the competition in ninth place, she'll always be first place to her immense and growing fan base. Suzanne Summers has certainly had an incredible career before and after her breakout success on Three's Company. Few other entertainers, male or female, have been able to retain such a prominent spot in the public eye. And she's been able to keep a positive and solid reputation over all these years, with very little tabloid drama to speak of. All things considered, any entertainer would be lucky to have a career as successful and consistent as hers. <laughs> I'm Ralph Burley. I'm Jack Tripper. Oh my God! You've finally gone over the edge! Do you talk to him often? <laughs> Every day. Every day? Yeah. Is he doing well? Yeah, he's fine. Good. Do you have a good time being in this? I loved it. It was a great time. It's a wonderful movie. Mm-hmm. Proud. That's a really tough question because, you know, come on, there's like, if you look at the 50 greatest shows, I would like to be on 48 of them, uh, you know, starting with Seinfeld. But I, I, 
I've thought about this. Good idea. Okay. watching your vlog, really even if I didn't know you. Because who doesn't want to make a movie? What's that? Maternity clothes. <laughs> Isn't it cute? <laughs> Cindy, I, I have to ask you something. Go ahead. Hadn't done through the on the with the cameras all going and people coming in because the, the famous story about him too is one time, like Joy said, you'd walk up this stage and you'd have to run in and, and change your. Downstairs, we call it marriage. <laughs> Mrs. Roper, would you mind sleeping in my bed instead of on the couch? Oh, no, dear, not at all. <laughs> oh, Chrissy, Chrissy, I forgot. I, I'm out of night cream. Could I? about a weapon. Something big. The board is hosting a governor preview here tomorrow night. It would be a disaster for us if we had to post... To, to do things. <laughs> what kind of things? You know, like uh, things. Like, uh, things. Like? Like, uh, uh, like putting up a shelf? That's it. Putting up shelves. That's it. I don't have to guess. I know what you are. <laughs> Whatever he is, he's a funny-looking one. We're gonna be seeing a lot of each other. 
Oh, I think we've seen enough already. I take my duties very seriously, girls. No way, I'm taking you to bed whether you like it or not. Aha! Uh -huh. yeah. This time I got you dead to rights. Well, Mr. Furley, you don't understand. I don't have to understand. I caught you red-handed. Mr. Furley, it's not what it looks like. Oh, don't give me that innocent stuff again. You got the evidence right in your hand. Look, Mr. Mr. Furley. Furley. Oh, 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 sure. I understand. Well, Chrissy, just would you help me limp down to the Regal Beagle? Nothing doing. I want you in bed. <laughs> Don't go away. There's another episode of Three's Company next on TV Land. So go ahead, knock on that door.